Felix here, and welcome to this Sunday live stream special. I wanted to cover here what's happening in the Ukraine, not from a really news point of view, but how this actually affects markets. We, of course, will also look at a little bit of what the news is doing. And there have been some serious developments uh, since, well, in the last 24, 48 hours, and that is the partial cutoff of Russian banks from the SWIFT system. Now, the SWIFT system is basically, I think in the US you call it sort of the ACH type stuff, like basically interbank uh, transfers of, of, of funds all go through SWIFT. The vast majority of those fund transfers in the world go through SWIFT. Russia gets paid billions and billions and billions of dollars for all of its energy and commodity exports every single day through SWIFT. So what's the impact here? Well, it's a mixed one. But there is going to be a very severe interruption in the next couple of days of energy traders and, and the, the big commodity brokers and their ability to do business with Russian partners. Why? Because a lot of the banks that are handling those oil and gas and commodity exports at the moment have been blocked from SWIFT. So they can't accept any funds. They're not able to. There is a workaround because there are certain banks that have not been targeted. Why? Because Europe is dependent on Russian gas and they don't want to fully turn the tap off yet. Although Germany today confirming that they're going to resume construction of a, an LNG, a liquefied um, petroleum uh, uh, terminal in Germany, which is something for some reason that they actually stopped building. So they are realizing here, hang on, we are energy dependent on our sort of new enemy. And therefore, until all of these existing gas and oil companies have opened up new accounts, changed the way they transfer and funnel their funds through their brokerages and traders and so on, they are basically not able to do business. But this is a short-term problem. So this is going to get energy prices slightly crazy in the next couple of days. And OPEC has just said, we're not pumping up more, more oil just because Russia is in this situation. And also, when you talk to some of the, the commodity brokers out there, they're saying, look, a lot of people might just simply not want to touch Russian commodities, because even though there is no sanction on those, they might be worried that there will be, or they simply might not want to deal with it, might not want to have the, the stigma of those, of you know, dealing with Russia, essentially, or it might make their banking more difficult or jeopardize their banking. So that's essentially what the SWIFT um, sanctions are doing. And bear in mind, Russia exports one-sixth of all the commodities in the world. So this is really not like cutting off Venezuela or something like that. And that's the other part of the sanctions, that they are basically cutting the Russian central bank off from international banking. And that's never happened on such a scale to a country, country of that size. I mean, literally, they produce 10% of the, the world's oil and they export that. Europe entirely dependent on that. Uh, the largest manufacturer and exporter of grains and fertilizers, palladium, nickel, you know, all sorts of stuff, coal, steel, um, and, and, and also one of the largest wood exporters in the world. So expect inflation for those items to go up substantially more. That will first hit Europe because Europe directly gets their shipment from there. And it then, of course, it has trickle-on effects into the rest of the world, the United States, and, and so on. And what is that going to do to stocks? Well, it's going to, and if we look at the futures, let me show you, pull up the futures for you right here, right now, as that's loading. The futures are really green, which is kind of bizarre. The Nasdaq up 0.5%, S&P 2.2% up, Dow Jones up 2.5%, 840 points. But there is going to be this realization that, hang on, this is actually going to cause substantially more inflation and these interruptions and disruptions to international trade flows are going to get bigger. Now, we've already seen what the impact is of US-Chinese disputes 
and what that does to the long-term supply chain, right? It seemed so easy when Trump said we're going to basically decouple here consciously. It has resulted in a great deal of interruption to businesses and, and it's caused inflation. Now, funnily enough, mentioning Donald Trump here, he was bullying or perhaps rightfully asking European NATO partners to spend more money on defense. And the Europeans were kind of like, yeah, think about that, but we probably won't. But you know what Germany's just done? And I, I am German, so I should always put that disclaimer out there. They are going to increase their defense spending by basically doubling it pretty much this year. And they're basically taking it from one and a half percent of GDP to more than 2% of GDP. And that's a first. And I mean, a lot of US presidents have tried that over the year. Uh, and um, it basically took Putin for them to actually commit to that. And the other thing that they're going to do is they're apparently going to purchase US F-35 fighter jets. So good news for Lockheed Martin shareholders. The um, To give you an idea, so they're going to spend this year 100 billion US 100 billion euros, of my apologies, for military investments. 100 billion euros. The German defense budget last year was 47 billion. The whole thing, including paying everybody, the, the, whole, the whole thing, including uh, investments. So they are basically spending an enormous amount of money here, more than twice their annual defense budget on ramping up infrastructure. And, and Robert uh, Florin here, you are quite right. Putin is basically pulling out the nuclear card because he's seeing that, one, invading the Ukraine is proving harder than he thought. I think they thought they could just roll through it and, and there would be very little resistance. But the Ukrainians are a fairly tough lot. And a lot of the Ukraine is functioning relatively normal. I, I'm fortunate to work with several people in the Ukraine. And... I've been messaging with them today. They have internet, they have power, they have Wi-Fi. And yes, they have moved, of course, uh, from, from the hotspots, but they are actually able to go on somewhat with their, with their normal lives, which is, which is amazing and shows what the resilience of that country is. 85% of the internet is available as normal in the Ukraine. So Russia has not shut down the country. They have not succeeded in that, at least um, not yet. And we hope it remains that way, of course. So... As European countries are coming together and sort of sending arms and more support and getting more draconian on Russia, Putin is throwing out the uh, the, the nuclear card going, don't, don't push me too far. Uh, I am crazy. And that's kind of what works in his advantage, is that the more crazy he comes across, the more he gets, right? That's basically what we've taught the world's dictators, is that the more unpredictable you are, the more insane you are, the more you can get away with, right? That, that's essentially what we've done. So we've we've rewarded, you know, the uh, the North Koreans. We've rewarded those kind of despots, whereas the ones that came to the table and said, "All right, uh, you want me to get rid of, um, you know, weapons of mass destruction? Look at, you know, Libya, Gaddafi. Not exactly a nice chap, but he did. And what happened to him? Well, he's dead, right? What about Saddam Hussein? He got rid of his nuclear his, his um, weapons of mass destruction or what happened to him well they hang him hung him so that's unfortunately what your you know international policy has been so putin knows that he knows as more crazy i act the more i get away with it and robert you're quite right there is also an article out on reuters that um musk is stepping in uh, let me show it to you actually i have it open here i believe at least i did a moment ago here it is elon musk says starlink satellites uh, services activated in Ukraine where the Russian invasion has caused internet disruptions. And that's definitely a, a good thing. And I mean, Starlink is fantastic. I mean, the idea is if you are in places without the infrastructure that can provide that. But it isn't fully available in all places at the same time in the world yet. They still need to put up a lot more satellites. But uh, they are apparently repositioning some of this to, to make sure that uh, the Ukraine has more internet available to them. And that was at the request of um, a Ukrainian minister, um, Mikhailo Fedorov. And he basically is the vice prime minister of the Ukraine. And he tweeted, literally tweeted uh, to Elon and said, hey, give us internet. And Elon wrote back and said, it's now active, more are en route because they have to reprogram where things are going. Uh, Serekon is saying, do you think Palantir will benefit from the increased defense budgets? Well, 
it's probably no coincidence that Alex Karp was at the Munich security conference. I know it's a big part of that world, uh, but I, I imagine they they had some conversations there and that there was some pressure being put on the Germans to actually for once spend some money on defense because Germany's essentially been relying on the US to defend it. Uh, and so they have this, uh, you know, not very heavily equipped army because the Germans have never, since World War II, for obvious reasons, not really been one to to really embrace uh, war or defense expenditure. So it's always been a very small part there. Um, I, I would think that Palantir would benefit from that. We have no idea to what extent, but we do know that they are working with German national secret services and they're working with the German police and so on, and that there have been high-level talks in Germany Germany will probably never never admit to that. Um, they might never ever uh, put those out. We know the French work with them, the UK works with them, the US works with them. So when all your allies use this system, you kind of need to be on it too, especially if you want to use the, the, the arms that they are uh, providing. Uh, Alex, you have an interesting point that the um, German uh, Luftwaffe, the, the Air Force, does not have people trained on the F-35. But then when you buy um, military aircraft, they don't show up the next week, right? It takes it takes a while for them to actually get manufactured and shipped over and so on. So, you know, you don't get these short-term fixes for the situations like this. Uh, so I, I would imagine there might be time to train people. But yes, I also was surprised. I, I would have thought that uh, the Germans would always buy that. But I think the idea here is, and that's what he's saying, um, Scholz, the, the German chancellor, he was saying the uh, fighter jets and tanks must be built in Europe jointly with European partners, particularly with France. And that's always the way it's been done. Uh, highly inefficient, but politically necessary, it seems. So I, I, you know, you might see Lockheed Martin setting up a, a factory somewhere, probably one in France and one in Germany. That's always the nonsense there. And that they might then start producing these locally. So these probably won't come into operations for years. But, you know, that, that that's the way these things work. Uh, it, it's not like you, you, can't, you can't go to Walmart and pick up an F-35. And Alan, you're quite right. Uh, Putin hasn't overtly threatened anyone. He's just put his nuclear weapons teams, if you will, uh, troops on alert, which just sort of says to the world, hey, we are more crazy than you gave us credit for. So, 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 so back off, right? Um, so if we have a quick look at what the map looks like here, let me show this to you. This is basically, this is the Ukraine. And you can see the invasions from Belarus up here. That was the Chernobyl bit that they took. That was very, very quick and very early, simply because it's the, the direct route to Kiev. And then Kiev uh, is holding up um, rather strongly, despite being bombarded. There is also a curfew in place, I understand. And then, you know, you see them coming in from east, uh, southeast, uh, which are the previously kind of Russian-controlled territories down here. And then also uh, from, from the Crimea, which is what Russia took over in 2014. So you do have a genuine full-blown invasion of the Ukraine. And I honestly, I was wrong on this. I didn't think they'd do that. I thought they would um, keep going with the salami tactics and, and, and slice off bits and bits and bits and, and, and be happy with these eastern provinces. But Russia definitely is not. Russia wants the whole thing. And that is proving much, much more difficult. Let me play you here a little bit of European news. Um, one sec. Okay, they've gone to... No, they haven't gone to weather. Uh, Ursula Lyon is also uh, meant to speak again here. Let me just put this on for a second. Extraordinary images, isn't it, from the streets of Kharkiv uh, over the course of the day. Uh, the absolute contrast to what you'd imagine would be happening when the Russian invasion began. Um, there was um, concern, like Western officials had said that they really thought that the Ukrainian forces would, would probably be overwhelmed quite quickly. Um, but that is absolutely not what's happening. Um, the resistance... Uh, is is uh, def at, at at a minimum slowing things down, but it actually seems to have so far failed to uh, to allow the Russian troops to take and hold any of the major cities. And this is day four of an invasion that 
I, for, according to Western officials in terms of their understanding of the Russian plans, so you've, we've obviously not had a readout from inside the Kremlin about what their plans were, um, but they seem to think this was meant to be a, a quick lightning attack. Um, the, the ambition was to take to basically encircle Kyiv. Obviously, you had the operations in the east and the south, including around Kharkiv, but that was more about containment, containing the Ukrainian forces down there that are believed to be the most effective, and then at the same time moving on the capital, encircling the capital, controlling the population, and then toppling the regime. None of that has happened. Uh, yes, the capital is, uh, is currently under a, a curfew and the, we've been told that Ukrainian forces need that curfew to be able to go out and, and, and hunt down uh, suspected Russian saboteurs. And yes, there are uh, Russian forces uh, outside the capital, but they too have been engaged with Ukrainian troops and have failed to advance. So it really is not playing out as Russia had expected. And the longer this goes on, the harder it becomes for Russia to achieve its objectives, unless it significantly escalates the violence. Deborah, thank you very much. Let's go over to Washington then and speak now to Mark Stone. And Mark, uh, Vladimir Putin taking this into the realms of the unthinkable today. Uh, how will uh, America react? Well, no word from uh, President, Putin, uh, President Biden himself, uh, nothing official on camera, but uh, we have had a statement that came through very, very quickly uh, following what we heard President Putin announce uh, in the Kremlin. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, it's from a senior administration official and says, at every step of this conflict, Putin has manufactured threats to justify more aggressive actions. He was never under threat from Ukraine or from NATO, which is a defensive alliance that will not fight in Ukraine. The only reason his forces face a threat today is because they invaded a sovereign country and one without nuclear weapons. This is yet another es escalatory and totally unnecessary step. Um, now, uh, the senior defence officials here in, in Washington uh, have been talking a little more uh, and answering questions about uh, what the, UK, the US's position is in terms of its own strategic defence. Um, and they say, <coughs> excuse me, that they will not talk about the specifics of uh, their strategic posture, uh, but they remain confident in their ability to defend themselves, that is America and their ally, allies and partners, and that includes in this strategic deterrent realm. Um, so, so really very worrying language from uh, President Putin, a man whose mind, they, uh, whose head they've never been able to get into, uh, and they are not, no one is quite sure of his, uh, quite where, what his state of mind is, which is why a phone call that he took today from Israel's prime minister uh, is potentially useful. Uh, Israel is in a, an interesting position. It classes America as its closest ally, but it has very good diplomatic relations with the Russians and with the Ukrainians. So they see themselves perhaps as some sort of a, a, a peacemaker in all of this. Well, maybe, but in the immediate, the fact that Naftali Bennett, the Israeli prime minister, spoke to Putin, I'm told by Israeli sources the phone call was half an hour. That's not short, uh, a half hour phone call between these two leaders. And I'm also told that Naftali Bennett briefed and then debriefed American officials after, uh, the, the before and after that phone call. So uh, if there is an attempt, and there must be, to get into the mind of President Putin, to understand his state of mind as he makes these extraordinary threats, uh, well then phone calls like that and contacts like that are useful. Um, the other thing to, to update you on, again from these defense officials uh, here in Washington, uh, is just a, a bit of a picture of where they think the battlefield is right now. Uh, and as Deborah was saying, um, everyone is surprised uh, and encouraged that the, that the um, uh, Russian uh, advance has not been as fast as they, as they thought. That said, they say that Russia has launched uh, around about 320 missiles, most of them short-range ballistic missiles over the past four days. Uh, and there are indications that quite a lot of those failed uh, to launch. So it builds that picture that the Russian military is not the force that, that, that many were concerned it would be. Supply problems as well as something the Americans 
are now seeing a lot. They're running out of fuel, the Russians. Uh, th their advance might have been quite quick, but their supply behind that advance, which is so crucial for an invasion, uh, is not there. Uh, and then interestingly, a, a point on, on the number of forces that he may still have behind in, in, in Russia along the border. One third of the 175 or so thousand troops that Putin had on that border are still have still not crossed into Ukraine. So that's 50 or so thousand soldiers still in Russia that could potentially come through. OK, Mark, thank you very much indeed. And as Deborah was also saying, here in Kiev, the city is under a 36 hour curfew. Uh, the expected uh, major Russian advance into the city hasn't yet come. The forces are around 20 miles away, according to Kiev's uh, mayor, the former world heavyweight champion Vitaly Klitschko. Our chief correspondent Stuart Ramsey reports on a capital under curfew. Smoke billows over the Kiev skyline as the Russian forces draw closer to Ukraine's capital. But their main effort still hasn't been launched. There is a continuing curfew here until Monday at least. The only people on the streets are Ukrainian security forces. And they're hunting down Russian saboteurs. Sky News filmed as men in plain clothes, supported by soldiers, arrested two men in a black SUV. We don't know why they were targeted, but it illustrates the tension here. Okay, so just a yeah, interesting and quick update there, really, on um, from from uh, UK news that there isn't that much movement on the ground, which is, I mean, encouraging, as they say, but it also just means that this war is likely to drag on much, much longer. And we have seen in the past what Russia does when it doesn't get its way. Um, you know, you, you might remember the uh, wars in, uh, in, in oh, here's, here's Klitschko speaking, it's funny, isn't it? To see a, a, the boxer is now the mayor of, of Kiev. A very intelligent chap, this one. Uh, so, you know, Russia then went out, out and basically carpet bombed cities and just destroyed absolutely everything. Now, the Ukraine is a little bit too big for that, but it is surprising that they haven't managed to take any of the, um, of the major uh, cities yet. Um, Sean asking here, do you think this will affect it, uh, JP Morgan or Blackstone? It is definitely affecting the energy sector. We just saw BP uh, are removing themselves from their Rosneft investment. That's They owned about 20% of that joint venture, uh, which was must be worth a lot of money. And I bet they're not selling that at top dollar because they basically haven't really got a choice to get out. And there will be plenty of others. I mean, there is a plenty of Russian uh, investment in Russia from uh, major German companies, major French companies, major European companies, who will potentially be hurting substantially. I mean, from engineering to manufacturing to Mercedes, you know, all these kind of brands uh, are actually selling a great deal in Russia, and that market might now be completely closed off to them. So the market will slowly start to realize that there are a significant number of stocks out there with Russia exposure and funds out there with Russia exposure, uh, and that is, of course, going to hurt investors here. Lubov says it could be good for, for Palantir. Uh, yes, potentially. Although I, I think the way Palantir works, it's not like um, you know someone who supplies missiles or something which you're going to order today and you want them tomorrow. It might just encourage more of NATO and more European countries to spend significantly more on defense, like Germany's just confirmed today they're spending 100 billion US dollars on investments this year, which is twice their total defense budget. So it, it is a fairly staggering figure here as we keep seeing pictures from um, uh, from uh, the, the, the Ukraine here. Uh, Europe has also done some other moves which are not that important. I mean, they've shut airspace to, to, Amer to US pl uh, Russian planes rather and, and so on. But I don't think that really has a big impact. They, you know, they're banning um, state media and Facebook has banned Russian ads and it's all these little things, but that isn't really what's happening here. I think what we need to come to terms with is that just like when, and this is of course a much more extreme situation, when the Chinese-US trade war kicked off, this is sort of similar in a sense, is that Europe and the US import a tremendous amount of Russian commodities, whether that's nickel or aluminium or wood or 
coal or gas or oil or any of the other major um, uh, commodities that Russia exports, and that will stop. Not overnight, although there will be significant disruptions in the next three days because of the inability of most of those Russian suppliers to receive funds because of the SWIFT uh, lockout. But there are certain banks that have been left standing just for the sole purpose that Europe can basically pay for its gas and keep getting it while they're building liquefied um, petroleum or liquefied gas terminals in Germany, for example. But all of that is going to take some time. So uh, Europe is simply not in a position to cut Russia off completely. Uh, but you do see here British Petroleum, for example, I don't know what that's going to do to the share price, um, exiting its almost 20% shareholding in Rosneft, which is a huge, huge oil and gas company in Russia. Okay. If you have any questions, do feel free to shout them out. Um, I'm very, very happy to always uh, uh, answer anything or discuss anything you, you wish to look at. Uh, we do have, I believe, um, the head of the European Commission uh, is due to speak very, very shortly. Hang on, let's see what, uh, what he's got to say here. Let me put on the audio for you. Okay, so you see, yeah, we continue to see pictures here from from the Ukraine, basically, uh, with with uh, you know the curfews happening and so on. And I mean, what does it all mean for the market? I think that's always something. Is, it sounds sounds kind of absurd, really, in, in these situations. But it is something, we, of course, we we do need to to look at. And um, apologies if the uh, connection here was a bit slow. Just uh, the stream seems to be back. Um, Uh, Ushniesh is saying here, Russia banning planes of its airspace would make a lot of flights to Asia unprofitable. Well, we did have a similar situation in the 2014 after uh, Russia downed a, a Dutch airliner, I believe it was, uh, over Ukrainian airspace. Uh, all the planes were diverting through the Middle East. So that is a route that is possible. It, it might be a little bit longer. It might be a little bit more fuel intensive, but there, there is an alternative. We don't necessarily have to fly uh, over that territory. Obviously, the Ukraine airspace has been closed now for some, some days, so we don't necessarily need to fly through Russia. To European governments are happy, like the Germans, to buy 40% of their gas from this Russia, because you are literally financing Putin's war machine. Uh, so I think that is something that will take the market a few days to realize. And there'll be more and more big companies coming out. We're pulling out of this. We're pulling out of that. It's going to cost us money. And we have to go and buy things in other places that will cost us money. Will there be beneficiaries? Yes. For example, those um, uh, shippers with uh, you know liquefied petroleum tankers, they will benefit from this. There'll suddenly be a huge demand for that because everything that goes to Europe at the moment comes through pipelines. If you need to move it by vessels, then you're going to have to pay a lot more for that. You're going to have to need to pay a lot more for storage, for example. And there'll be many, many other uh, businesses that will also benefit and flourish under this, as there's always the case with war. But a, a great deal of industry will definitely uh, suffer from this. 
Uh, Axel says, is China's business affected by this? Well, no, not directly. I think China is unlikely to jump on the uh, sanction bandwagon here. So in a way, they will be able to perhaps get Russian oil uh, at, at slightly lower prices because there are less takers for it. In a way, they might actually benefit from this in the short term. How that works out in the long run, we'll have to see. But essentially, China is in a position to, to, to absorb quite a lot of European demand. Not all of it, but quite a bit of it. Okay, so let me just see here if um, we were expecting Ursula Leyen to talk at half past, which is now. Uh, but I think instead, I don't know, maybe they will play it. I'll put the sound on in a second when they do, uh, if they do start. The president of Ukraine says they will send a delegation to meet Russian officials for talks at the Belarusian border. The EU and its allies exclude a number of Russian banks from SWIFT, the international payments process, in a move that could cost Moscow billions. The office of the president of Ukraine has said that a delegation will be sent to meet with Russian diplomats on the Belarusian border as Moscow's forces draw nearer to Kyiv. Zelensky's office said on the Telegram messaging app that the two sides would meet but did not give a precise location or time for the meeting. The development follows news earlier that Russian President Vladimir Putin had ordered his country's nuclear forces to be put on high alert in response to what he called, quote, aggressive statements by leading NATO powers. Earlier this week, the Russian leader threatened to retaliate harshly against any nations that intervened directly in the conflict in Ukraine. Russian diplomats had been sent to Belarus to await peace talks with the Ukrainians. The Ukrainian government had initially rejected the invitation to travel to Belarus, where Russia has stationed a significant number of troops. They said, however, that they would be willing to open dialogue at another neutral venue. Sunday is the day of general curfew in Kyiv. The residents of Ukrainian capital were asked... Okay, um, uh, ATF here, there. welcome. Welcome from Sweden. Um, how will this affect NEO, you are asking? Well, there isn't a direct effect on NEO from a from a business day-to-day -day point of view. I mean, say some of the aluminium or something might eventually come from Russia. Uh, China is still able to import that. So there isn't really that, that impact there. China seems to be looking to be somewhat neutral in this. They don't really want to be drawn into this. That, that's my, my feeling on this. And of course, I, I, I can't speak for the Chinese government. From what I'm seeing in the news is that they're not being actively supportive of Russia, but they're also not actively supportive of the European and American positions. So they are basically sort of saying, well, um, you know, they should talk and they should sort this out and, and, and you know, uh, they, they should come back to peace. Uh, but they are... So that's kind of good, and that's kind of what we want to see, right? We don't want to see um, China taking sides with Russia because that would potentially hurt those Chinese listed companies quite quite severely. So we kind of um, hope that it uh, doesn't doesn't um, happen. Charles says SoFi does not involve Swift banking. Uh, SoFi is is at this point largely an American institution, so no, I, I don't think that's they are affected by this. To be honest with you. Uh, Axel, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Sweden, a lot of European nations who are typically very, very adverse to supplying weapons like the Swedes and, and you know, like the Germans and so on, are now coming out and saying, we will, we will do that. We will effectively block Russian imports and exports. We commit to ensuring that a certain number of Russian banks are removed from SWIFT. This will ensure that these banks are disconnected from the international financial system and harm their ability to operate globally. SWIFT is the world's dominant global interbank payment system. Cutting banks off will stop them from conducting most of their financial transactions worldwide and effectively block Russian exports and imports. The European Union and its partners are working to cripple Putin's ability to finance his war machine. Now, the only problem with that, of course, is that Europe does finance its war machine because 
they import 40% of, of all their gas from Russia. So it's sort of like, yes, step in the right direction. But really, Europe needs to become independent from Russian oil and gas imports and much, much more. And all of these sanctions allow a loophole for those energy and those commodity exports into Europe to continue. So that's really um, where you could really hit them. We had this important victory. This is a fair decision to cut Russia off from the international payment system. It means billions and billions of losses for Russia. It's a concrete price for its treacherous invasion of Ukraine. Zelensky also welcomed Berlin's decision to send military aid to Ukraine. Germany, one of the most reluctant to send offensive equipment, will dispatch a th Okay. Of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who joins me now. Thank you so much for speaking to Euronews. Thank you for having me. Now, the European Union has just announced fresh measures, fresh sanctions targeting Belarus. Is the EU finally ready to stop this war and stand up to Vladimir Putin, the Russian president? We never wanted this war. Ukraine never wanted this war. It is President Putin, indeed, who started this war and is leading this war. And we are answering with uh, harsh sanctions on the financial and economic field. Today, I have proposed the third package of sanctions. And it's a whole package from financial sanctions, for example, decoupling uh, some Russian banks from SWIFT to freezing assets of the Russian Central Bank, listing pers personalities, but also for the very first time in the European Union, providing military equipment uh, to Ukraine, a country in, under attack in conflict. But we are doing two more steps. Um, today we decided to close our airspace for any Russian aircraft and we will ban Russia today and Sputnik because they are the propaganda machine of the Kremlin's war. And you're also going after Belarus. Indeed. Uh, we are also enlarging the sanctions uh, towards Belarus. It's basically mirroring the sanctions that we have on Russia for Belarus to make sure that there's no way for, to, for any kind of circumvention. And how far will solidarity with Ukraine go? Excuse me? How far will solidarity with Ukraine go? Because of course Europeans and Europe will have to pay a price for these measures. Yes, we know that every war comes at a cost and um, solidarity is huge with uh, Ukraine. If you look at the refugees that are welcomed in the European Union, the financial support, now the military equipment support, all this it shows that there's a strong solidarity with Ukraine. They share our values. They defend our principles. They are the ones who want to have a peaceful democracy and Russia is attacking that and therefore they deserve our full solidarity and they have it. And while we're speaking here tonight, they're on the streets outside the, the Berlin Mall, calling for also European Union membership. Should Ukraine be, be given candidacy for EU membership? We have a process with Ukraine that is, for example, integrating the Ukrainian market into uh, the single market we do have. We have a very close cooperation on the energy grid, for example. So many topics where we work very closely together. And indeed, over time, they belong to us. They are one of us and we want them in. And you mentioned people arriving, of course, to Europe. Thousands of people have already arrived in Poland and also in Romania. Do you have a master plan to welcome these people? Absolutely. We've been preparing for weeks uh, for different options. And of course, there's a huge openness to welcome these refugees. We have contingency plans with the different member states. And of course, all those member states who are not frontline, uh, front, frontline states are also, of course, willing to take in refugees. And will you trigger the EU refugee protection law? Well, this is a question if it's needed. Of course, we can any time do it. Um, so we are very open to that. Um, and this will be something we will discuss with our member states. And tell me, this war seems to be a bit of a game changer for Europe. How will this war reshape the European Union? First of all, there is an unprecedented um, cooperation and standing together by all democracies 
that we see our American friends, the UK, Canada, joined by Japan, South Korea, just to name a few. Australia is also part um, of the group. So this shows we stand up together to defend democracy. For the European Union, it's important that we defend our peace order, the rules-based order, and that we are very clear as a power, as a European Union, that we do not tolerate on European soil the trampling on our values. And just finally, have you got any faith in the talks, the peace talks, and will you ever trust Vladimir Putin again? Of course it is important um, that the Ukrainian side agrees to the peace talks and that conditions are fine for the Ukrainian side. In general, it is always better to have peace talks than to have a fight. The trust in President Putin is completely broken and eroded. Okay. Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, thank you so much for joining us on your own news. Thank you for having me. Okay, that there was a live interview with Ursula von der Leyen, who's probably somewhat the most important and powerful woman in Europe, um, or, you know, man, woman, and, and, and child, for that matter, um, who ironically wanted to uh, succeed, succeed um, Angela Merkel and then got this job, which is potentially the bigger one. Uh, but beside the point here is, okay, sanctions. Uh, CYF, for example, you guys are talking about, you know, are sanctions effective? Well, the problem with sanctions at the moment are that, yes, SWIFT will hurt Russia, for sure. Okay, but let me draw you a, a sort of a bit of a diagram here. So essentially, what have you got? You've got Russia here. You've got the EU over here, right? And what happens? Russia sends lots of oil and gas and commodities, but let's just call it gas for simplicity over there. And what does the European Union do? The European Union sends lots of money. Now, what they've done is that they have cut off, so in the middle are, are some banks, Russian banks, right? Lots of them. So there are, you know, plenty of them. So what have they done? Well, by excluding certain Russian banks, but not all from the SWIFT system, they're essentially eliminating a bunch of these banks, but they're leaving at least one or two or three standing. So it'll cause inconvenience and disruption to Russian oil and gas exporters and to traders and commodity traders and, and the whole industry and likely drive up prices. But what isn't fundamentally changing is the fact that the EU imports tremendous amounts of oil and gas and wood and grains and nickel and copper and aluminium and absolutely everything else. Russia exports one and produces one-sixth of the world's commodities and the EU is by far the largest customer. So until the European Union changes this dependency and finds another dealer for its crack addiction here to Russian commodities, the EU will continue to send billions and billions of dollars to Russia every single day. And that's bizarre because the EU is now sending arms to the Ukraine, essentially uh, creating a proxy war there, if you will, putting sanctions on Russia and Belarus and Putin and so on. But they are not able to quickly address this oil and gas dependency. So what are they doing? Well, Germany is starting to build a liquefied uh, gas terminals in, in German ports, uh, but that'll take I mean, even if you're really, really quick, I mean, in Germany, things normally take years, but say they wave through everything and they just get it built. It'll still take them months to do that. You then need to send lots of vessels full, full of gas and, and supply that. I don't know whether logistically that's possible to completely replace Russia there with that, but that's the fundamental problem. Countries like Germany, Italy, Netherlands, um, and, and much of other parts of Europe are very, very reliant on Russia. So you have this wish to cut Russia off, but you are not able. So there's a lot of talk here. And, and of course, I think everybody welcomes these sanctions uh, at this point as things have gone much, much further. But are they hurting Russia? Yes. But is Europe still financing Russia? Yes. So until that's stopped, uh, you really are not stopping Russia. You're slapping them on the wrist. So really what you need is an oil and gas embargo and that kind of thing. But I don't think anyone has the stomach for that yet. So this is just the Russian um, 
I think the Russian defense minister rattling through uh, what he thinks, uh, you know, they hit and so on. Uh, British Petroleum just announced that they are getting out of their 20% stake in Rosneft. And <laughs> we should build Nord Stream 3000, yes, from the US. I mean, the US is able to be um, energy self-sufficient. They've shown it in the past. As long as oil prices stay above $100, um, American oil is able to, to replace any imported oil. Uh, we saw that about 10 years ago, right? Michael says, don't look behind the curtain. You're only supposed to look at the, at the shiny object. Uh, I think you're kind of referring to what, what you know, the, the, the news wants us to believe, which is that uh, you know, these sanctions are going to cripple Russia. And, and Ursula von der Leyen just said that, but they're not. And it, it's a lie. I'm sorry to say it, but it's just a lie. They're not crippling Russia. What would cripple Russia is if we completely cut off uh, all, all imports of oil and gas and commodities. And that's also what my chief financial analyst agrees with me here. So good evening from Tallulah. So the war rages on um, to, I think, Putin's frustration much, much, much more slowly than they thought. Uh, the Ukrainians are so far able to withstand the Russian assault, which is, is, is quite tremendous. Uh, and really kudos to them, to, to their, their guts. And much of the Ukraine is functioning somewhat as normal. Uh, I, I work with people in the Ukraine who are fantastic people, uh, and they are able to go online, and they have Wi-Fi and, and mobile phone reception, and they are able to do their, their business, which is really quite incredible. So uh, it, is, it isn't all of the Ukraine that is under this horrific attack, thankfully. Uh, Greg the, uh, is saying the German military 100 billion is bullish on Palantir. Yes, I, I, I tend to agree with you on that, especially given that they're saying they're going to buy F-35s, which I never thought Germany would agree to. But I think essentially the bullying by, by Trump is in a way paying off. And that's often what, what happens and what you see when uh, you know, one, one uh, president tries to do something and the next gets the credit for what is actually achieved here. So I think Germany spending twice its usual defense budget just on investments this year it means they're going to spend three times as much on defense in 2022 as they were in 2021. Uh, I would imagine a fair bit of that will go to Palantir and, and, and other companies like that. Will we ever find out? Very unlikely. I don't think the Germans will ever admit to actually using Palantir for their, their military or their secret service. Uh, Jess asking how the market's going to respond to the war crisis. Well, so far, the futures are actually very green. The futures are up, which seems slightly baffling. But it's just because the market has seen that the sanctions are not as horrific as they could be for the financial market. I mean, yes, there are some who are affected, like British Petroleum, for example, and there will be plenty of others. But if you really went all in and you actually cut off the energy supply, that would have very, very severe uh, repercussions, especially for uh, European industry, the big energy users. And it would massively, massively spike inflation. I mean, you're thinking that there is you know, 10% inflation or something like that, that would probably double or triple it. So, which would also then cause a massive recession and it would cause the European central banks to pump money back into the market. So you're going to go back to quantitative easing before you've even, even pulled it back. So there is all of this that's potentially going to happen down the road here if there really is that fallout. But Russia isn't going to hold back its oil and gas because they're like getting the billions every day. And as long as Europe is willing to pay that and take this dirty energy, essentially, and these dirty com commodities, this is going to continue. The CYF is saying, yep, there are building pipelines, but it takes years to build pipelines. Even the um, liquefied um, gas storage that Germany is building will likely take, I mean, at least six months or something like that to get that up and running properly and get it certified and everything else under German um, you know, regulations. So, you know, that's essentially what's happening here. 
uh, Kiev under curfew because they're worried about saboteurs and they basically have snipers on the street. So uh, don't walk around Kiev at the moment. That's definitely not a, not a smart move. The ruble should tank. Yes, I agree with you on that. I think the ruble will tank. Uh, Russia has said, the Russian central bank has said that they will resume buying Russian gold. So they will simply take all of their money and they'll keep piling up gold because there's always a market for gold. And they might then be able to trade gold with certain friendly countries in exchange for foreign currency, right? But they're still, remember, they are getting paid lots of money in dollars and euros every year, every day, by their, all their export markets. So at this point, they are not going to be short of foreign currency. Uh, and Axel, you're completely right. The, the harshest sanction that they've put in so far is freezing Russian central bank deposits and basically cutting off the Russian central bank from the international banking network. That's what's actually the one thing that's actually really impactful. And that's never been done before on a country this size. I know we've done it with Venezuela and places like that, but you know, their economies are pretty limited. So there is definitely um, that. Uh, Sky News here showing a bunch of luxury goods. And of course, you know, a lot, a lot of the luxury goods houses will will get hurt. Uh, stocks like LVMH and so on uh, might might take a bit of a hit here because it is a big market for them, and and potentially they might be impacted by by sanctions here. CYF, thanks for sharing that. Uh, that Poland already has a a port for for LNG um, vessels. Uh, yeah, Germany simply doesn't have anywhere near the capacity. I mean, 40% of its gas comes from Russia. It comes through pipelines. And as you saw with the new pipelines they were building from Russia, they were planning on continuing with that. Okay, let's just see if we have um, some other actual news here, for example, from Euronews. You did actually just give us an exclusive interview here, which was definitely interesting. But... You know, you can see Russia here, um, sorry, Europe kind of struggling, wishing to do something, but not quite able to do the really harsh thing because it would, it would hurt Europe very substantially. And, and see why, if you're completely right, Europe is buying a lot of gas that gets, gets in by, you know, via uh, liquefied petroleum tankers and so on. But how long will it take to build the storage capacity to be able to replace the enormous amount that comes in from Russia. That's really the question here. Uh, Michael, okay, the problem with the SWIFT uh, sanctions is that they are, do not apply to all Russian banks. They've left a loophole here so that the energy business can continue. And that basically means, yes, there are disruptions. Yes, it's going to cost money. but Give it about three, four days and the Russian oil and gas exporters will have set up new accounts with the banks that are still connected to the SWIFT network and they'll be able to somewhat continue this export trade to Europe. So there is a big loophole here and I know the headlines are not saying it and I'm not making myself particularly popular by highlighting it, but it's just the truth. These sanctions have an enormous, enormous hole in the middle of them and you can drive a truck through it or a pipeline for that matter. So, yeah, Russian flights got banned into Europe. Okay, that's a fairly small thing. That's a bit like the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the football ban and those kind of type things that isn't really affecting them all that much. So, yeah, that's essentially what's going on, on in the Ukraine. It, it could be a, a, a decisive night if, provided Ukraine hopefully continues to hold the Russians off, it will frustrate Russians' efforts to uh, take Kiev. Uh, then we have to wait and see, and, you know, what's Russia going to do? They still have another 50,000, 60,000 troops on, on the border. They could bring those in. But do they have the will and the desire to be really bogged down by this war? Uh, well, I think they're also very proud people, the Putins. Uh, I don't think he's going to want to walk away with his tail behind, uh, you know, between his legs. So I, I think a prolonged war here in the Ukraine is sadly uh, what, what looks more and more likely every day. Uh, there are meetings at the Belarus border, you know, sort of peace talk type meetings. But I mean, I don't think we have huge expectations here for that. 
Uh, Michael, you're quite right. Uh, it's unclear at this point uh, how imports are affected. Uh, Russia obviously imports a lot of materials, uh, a lot of machinery and so on from, from Europe, uh, engineering equipment and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, it'll run out of things. It'll run out of parts and components. So the question is, can they source that elsewhere? Can they source that through China, for example? You know, the same European com companies also supply the same pieces of equipment to China. So, you know, sanction circumvention is unfortunately very, very common nowadays and, and very, very hard to, to kind of get around. Makes it more expensive? Yes, absolutely. But we are nowhere near this like full shut off. Uh, of 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 Russia from the international eco e e economy uh, at this point. So I think these are uh, unfortunate pictures of um, Russian police arresting protesters in uh, in in Russia who are protesting against the war. I think they've arrested something like too close to two thousand people there. Uh, and Vladimir, we, we don't hold that against you. I know everybody's called Vladimir. In fact, I work with some people in the Ukraine and they're also all called Vladimir uh, and they're fantastic and lovely people. So I think we, you know, we can make the distinction between uh, the leaders and the people. Uh, there are lovely Russian people, there are lovely Ukrainian people, and it's nothing against anybody here individually. And I really hope that uh, we can continue to, um, to respect our, our Russian and our Ukrainian friends. It's the leadership that we all have a problem with. And Vladimir, I, I do always love your sense of humor. So I, I truly appreciate you you tuning in um, every time you do. Um, I will continue to cover this. Uh, I'll be live tomorrow pre-market as well. Um, lots of stuff happening tomorrow as well in terms of earnings and so on. So uh, do, do, do stay tuned. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you want to get some more updates. Uh, I've also got some more videos coming out today that are non-Ukraine related. We also need to keep our minds clear and focus on what we want to achieve in our personal lives. So super important to do that. And if you wish to have a chat about that, uh, give us a call at felixrenz.org slash call and I, I'll tell you which of our programs get you to financial freedom faster. Because in times like this, nothing more important than financial freedom. It gives you a choice. And that's really what we all need. So thank you for tuning in. I do wish you a beautiful rest of the weekend and see you on the next video.